got a new baby in my life, and it is like the coolest thing ever. You guys want to see a picture? Uh, it is like the coolest thing ever. I'll turn my little clicky on. That is my baby. Um, I love it so much. Um, we do everything together. Uh, if anything ever happened to him, um, I'd be really sad. No, I'm joking. My real baby is this little guy, Sam. Uh, he is so adorable. He's so cute. Obviously, he gets it from his father, uh, is what I'm told. Um, and actually, it's just up the back there, if you guys want to turn. But you've got to be quiet. Just say, like, oh, but really quietly, because he's trying to sleep. Fantastic. So, uh, tonight, um, I want to introduce myself first uh, before I start talking. Uh, this is my family, uh, my wife and obviously my son before. This is like my immediate family, my extended family a bit more. Uh, my family, my sister, my dad, my mum, uh, my grandparents on the side there and little Sam in the middle. Uh, and my brother isn't there, my younger brother, his name's Daniel. Uh, that's him there on the left. Uh, he's uh, up in Darwin at the moment having a great time going bush out there all the time. He's a really cool guy. Uh, and can I just say, before I start anything tonight, um, I want to really affirm publicly my wife. Um, she's been doing such a good job taking care of our son. Um, I say all the time to all my friends, I'm so tired, it's so tough, yada, yada, yada. She gets up more than I do during the night, and she doesn't even say that kind of stuff. So can we just give like little fairy claps for my wife, because she is awesome. That is awesome. Um, so tonight, the topic of getting real... Um, as Jed said, I, I work for a company called Real Talk, and I share on this kind of thing. Uh, tonight, it's a little bit different, and it's a bit weird for me because usually I'm going off a script, uh, and I have Kim Keedy keeping me really accountable to the minutes, uh, and I can kind of see a stand up in my peripherals just uh, as it's getting to the end of my section, and I've got to make sure I say all the right things. Uh, it's really awesome. I love it. But tonight, I'm excited to go a little bit deeper um, and on a little bit of a different topic uh, that I haven't been on before. And I want to start off this topic by telling you an embarrassing story about myself. Um, so when I was in year two, uh, and the reason I'm thinking of this story is because I'm changing a lot of nappies nowadays. So I'm just thinking of like all like bodily fluids and liquids. Get ready for a bit of a gross story. Um, my son, Sam, he reminded me of this story. Um, it was in year two, and I got to explain the design of my primary school first. So there's a big square in the middle, and all the classrooms face into this square. And that's where you go out for recess, you play handball, do like six skimmies and stuff like that, it's awesome. Um, anyway, uh, all the classrooms are there. So if you're walking across uh, and you're sitting in class and you look, you can see anyone who walks across this square. It's this big undercover area. Um, one day, it's recess. Um, I do some mad through the leg skimmies, uh, get some people out. It's really cool. And then uh, the bell goes and I need to go to the toilet. Um, but I'm in King. You know, you, you don't want to get out of King because I'm nearly at Ace. Uh, so I keep playing, I keep playing. Then the teachers start going, get to class, get to class. Uh, and I'm like, all right, I've got to quickly run to the toilet before class starts, uh, and everyone's kind of filing into the room, so I'm running to the toilet, and then something kind of happens. Um, it's, this thing is like an express train to the Gold Coast. There's no stops. Uh, it's coming. It's, it's coming. Uh, I make it to the stall. As soon as I whip around, just before I sit down, uh, things happen, uh, and um, I'm kind of left kind of standing there, my little year two self, just feeling so ashamed, and I look in the mirror, and I go, Okay, the only way I can get out of this is if I can make it to the front office, which is across the square in between all the classrooms. And everyone's in class, and I'm meant to be in class. So I kind of inspect the damage, and that, that's, I can't hide that, can't hide that. So I end up walking as subtly as I can across the kind of quadrangle <laughs> of the school. Because if anyone sees me, I'm all good, nothing's happened. And it's kind of like making its way downtown. It just feels gross. It's, oh, man. I get to the front office. Uh, I'm crying by this stage, as you can imagine. And the office lady, she's really nice. She's a nurse as well, kind of like the school nurse lady. You know, she knows all the kids. She, she's kind of like a second mum. Uh, she's there. Uh, she's like wiping me down and saying it's okay, and I'm crying. I've never felt more shame in my life. I never went back to that office again. Like, I would get in trouble before I went back to this front office. If a teacher asked me, Matt, go to the front office, I'd say, no, thank you, I'm not going. Because I just didn't want to see her again. I didn't want to face up uh, to that moment. Um, there's so many times in my life where I can trace um, being embarrassed and being ashamed. There's another time I played trumpet in my primary school. I wasn't the best uh, trumpet player, but I was the best in the school. So everyone was terrible, but I was just a little bit better. So I was the guy 
that they picked to play the last post at every Anzac Day. And every Anzac Day, from primary school, year six, to the end of high school, year 12, I had to play the last post. And every time I stuffed it up, and every time I would go through school, and everyone would come up to me and say, well done, Matt, you did a great job. And I just knew that they were lying to me. And I felt so ashamed. And I was like, thank you, thank you. And it was just that same time every year that it came around. I was pretty happy to graduate. Haven't played trumpet since. Um, and there's some other times that I can trace where I was a little bit embarrassed. Um, if I read to you right now a letter, which I'm not going to do because we don't have time, because they're really long. If I read to you some letters that my wife and I used to write to each other in high school, that would be pretty embarrassing. Uh, I'd, feel, I'd feel pretty vulnerable and, I guess, like a bit exposed up the front here. So I'm not going to do that. But I just want you to know they're really soppy and they're really embarrassing, okay? Um, I work for Real Talk. We love to get the audience talking and feeling comfortable and uh, get some discussion going. So you have, I'm getting my teacher voice on now, you have one minute, so 30 seconds each, thank you, students, to share with the person next to you an embarrassing moment in your life. Make it a funny one, a joyful one, something embarrassing. You have 30 seconds, go. So I want you to kind of remember that story, remember that picture, I love sharing and speaking and using emotion because it's really powerful. I want you to remember that emotion because we're going to kind of enter into that little feeling of shame and exposure and embarrassment that you have. Um, we're going to enter into that later on and kind of use it to help us understand this topic of getting real uh, and being vulnerable and being real with ourselves and real with God. Emotions are really powerful. And as I was prepping for this talk, I had lots of time. I was sitting up late. Uh, with Sam, and when I wasn't playing Overwatch, um, I was writing this talk, and um, I was kind of just writing down words associated with getting real. What does that mean? And here's a kind of list of words I, I wrote. It means being authentic, it means being honest, real, true, humble, accepting reality, suffering, that's a hard one, having purpose, a real calling, I thought of the Ignite Conference theme, empty, how fortuitous, uh, fullness, filled with what, filled with truth, the truth of God, God is real getting real with God, getting real with ourselves. And the words kind of started to enter into that place of embarrassment and shame that I told you about. Words like embarrassing, mask, exposed. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, words like embarrassing, mask, exposed uh, started to prop up. And I want to kind of propose tonight that being vulnerable uh, and being real with God is the stuff of life. Like, it is, it is where we live life to the full. It's where we can experience uh, a depth of living that we haven't experienced before. And it's scary being vulnerable and being real with who we think we are, how we see ourselves, how we think God sees us. That can be really scary. But again, I want to propose tonight, just for, this, just for this moment, that we enter into that space and trusting that it's the stuff of goodness and it's the stuff of life. And it's going to be okay. You don't have to be afraid. Um, I want to share a story from my life. I want to share two stories, actually. The first one is where I had a moment of vulnerability that was really scary and really sad. And the second one is that I had a moment of vulnerability that was really exciting and really happy. Uh, because I think both are important when we're understanding this topic. The first moment, um, I was 16 years old, and it was my first summer camp. It was called Zero Gravity back then. Uh, which is a much cooler, no, it's not a cool name. They're all cool names, but uh, it's a really cool name to me because it's something I remember uh, about my life. And at this Zero Gravity, um, I won't get into too much detail, but essentially, we're in a room like this. The lights were down. We're having a moment of prayer and worship like we might experience tonight. And I had a moment where I accepted and saw myself finally for what Jesus saw me. And it was really full on. I kind of stripped away all these masks spiritually that I've been hiding behind, things like the clothes I, I wear, the way I presented myself, the, the music I listen to to make you think of me in a certain way. I kind of just let that fall away and let Jesus just see me for who I am. And it wasn't pretty. I cried my eyes out. Um, and even just remembering that moment now makes me emotional because it's powerful. I felt so vulnerable. I felt so scared. But you know what? I wouldn't trade that moment for the world. I wouldn't trade being totally open and exposed to God for the world. Even if it was a moment where I was really 
ashamed and disappointed in myself. But it was good. It allowed me to grow. It allowed me to see myself. And my story continues all the way up until a really awesome night, which is my wedding night. Okay. Um, my wife and I decided that we wanted to wait until we were married to share all of ourselves with each other, all our physical selves with one another. Um, and I remember my wedding night um, being nothing like any of my mates at high school said um, having sex would be like, you know. Um, I remember that night so well because I was so... Hey, buddy. That's where you came from, mate. <laughs> He's going to start crying. They're like, oh, really? <laughs> I remember that night so well because although I was so vulnerable and so exposed and just in a spiritual way and in a physical way being, here I am, accept me or love me, it's up to you. I don't know. I'm going to take that risk. I'm going to take that leap. Um, and I remember just being so fulfilled and so satisfied at a deep level, um, anything else, deeper than anything else I'd experienced before. And I hold that moment as importantly as I hold that moment at that first camp that I went to and that moment of vulnerability. Because both of those moments, I was completely stripped back and uh, open and ready to receive the truth and the reality of what was happening, the truth that Christ died for me and the reality that God had a plan and a purpose for me, whether it made me feel good, whether it made me feel sad. There's those two moments in my life that I'll always remember. I faced up to who I was in the eyes of Jesus. I faced up to who I was in the eyes of Jesus. Um, speaking of little Sammy over there, um, he's been ministering to us so well these past few weeks. Um, he is a baby, so he cries and he's hungry. And um, I've heard Kim speak about this before. Kim Keedy, she kind of understands the development and growth of young people. And uh, she, she said this thing once, and it kind of it shocked my world. She said, when little babies cry because they're hungry, they think they're going to die of hunger. So they just cry because they think they're going to die. And I think, yeah, fair enough, okay? Sometimes I get frustrated at Sam because it's 2 in the morning and I've got to get up at 5.30 that morning and he's crying. I'm like, dude, just wait five minutes while I change you. Stop kicking around. You're making a mess down here. You're going to get fed. But in his mind, he's like, no, I'm not. I'm going to die, Dad. I'm going to die right now. And that's why he's crying. Um, he is so okay. He is so totally... I spat as well, Jared. We have something in common. He's so totally okay with just crying out and being vulnerable and saying, help me, feed me, love me. He's okay with that. And I don't know the last time I really... I mean, I can definitely recall moments, and I try to every day in, in prayer. Um, don't usually get there, but um, I don't recall that many moments in my life where I've truly been okay to cry out to God in vulnerability and go, help me. And uh, as soon as... Caitlin gets up and she's such a trooper, she's such a saint. She gets up and she sits on the couch and uh, it's like two in the morning and it's cold and she holds him there feeding him. Uh, as soon as he starts feeding, he just stops crying and singing. And I'm like, man, you've got issues. <laughs> like, you need to sort yourself out. Um, but it's like this loud noise to this just nothing peacefulness. And you don't even care that he cried. You just look at him and you go, that is awesome. That is so cute. He is so totally okay that when the figure of God in his life, who right now is his mother, who feeds and takes care of him, you know, like she is God to him, he is so totally okay to immediately fully trust her and say, yep, I'm safe, I'm happy, I'm all good. Even though like five seconds up before that, it was not all good. He was like, man, breathe, like, come on, breathe. It's just crazy. Um, Sam is doing a much better job than me right now at being open and being vulnerable. Um, I'm learning a lot from him. So there's times in my life where I've been at my most vulnerable with Jesus and my most vulnerable with others. Those are the times that I remember. Those are the times that are really real. If we want to talk about getting real, what, what's the real stuff in life? The marrow that we remember. My granddad says, suck the marrow out of life. And I think that's disgusting, but I get it. He's saying, let's experience life to the full, you know? Even those times that are sad, 
for the vulnerable. Like that moment at, at, at that camp I told you about in my story, all those moments that are good and vulnerable. You know, um, that's the stuff of life. That's when we get real. That's when we remember them and go, yeah, I was alive then. That, I felt that. I felt that. And I kind of compare that to those times in my life where I've kind of put on a show, where I've worn a mask or presented myself in a certain way, said certain things that I don't really believe in, treated myself in a way that's, that I know is harmful, treated others in a way. There's some mysterious music going on. That's pretty cool. Uh, oh, actually, Andre, that is awesome. But we're not just texting yet. All right, thanks, mate. <laughs> Round of applause for Andre. That is, that is just awesome. <laughs> Was that a sneaky time signal as well, or am I good? I'm good. All right, great. So there's times in my life, I was like, that's subtle. Um, there's times in my life where I've, I've done those things and I've lived a way that I know really isn't me living up to my potential as, as a God-created, Christ-loved person. Um, that's when I don't really remember those moments. I mean, there's been millions of them and I don't remember them. They kind of just blur into life. But those moments that are real, whether they're good or bad, they pop up and I'll go, that was real. Christ was there with me and I remember that. So that's what I kind of want to encourage you tonight to do. Colossians 3 says that you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is your life, appears, when you see Christ in yourself, when Christ appears to you, that's when your life starts. That's when your life starts. And getting to that point means getting real, it means getting vulnerable, it means being exposed. That can be really scary, and I understand that. So I want to share with you uh, three things tonight as we worship, as we pray. Three things, three facts that will help you um, kind of trust and enter into a moment of vulnerability and openness. The first is that Jesus is not embarrassed by you. Jesus wasn't embarrassed by the lepers. Jesus wasn't embarrassed by prostitutes or small statured tax collectors. Uh, And he sure isn't going to be embarrassed by you. Actually, he was embarrassed one time. It's when his parents found him preaching in the temple. They'd be looking for him for three days. And they came up and they got him in trouble. And he's like, Mom and Dad, I'm trying to teach here, my disciples. He was only like 12. They got him in trouble. But he's Jesus. He's fully man. He's fully God. The fully human part, I mean, we're all human. We all get embarrassed by our parents. So I think God kind of knew what he was doing. Um, That was the only time. But hey, Jesus embraced who at that time were the lowest of the low. He wasn't embarrassed to go up and kiss a leper and embrace them. And he sure as heck isn't embarrassed by you. Actually, the only time that Jesus hung his head for you was when he died on the cross for you. It was when he gave his life for you. He loved. Number two, Jesus already knows you. In a way, it's kind of silly to go, Jesus, I don't really want to be vulnerable and open to you. And Jesus is like, yeah, that's cool. I, I already know who you are anyway and all your ins and outs. And we go, oh, yeah, okay, fair enough. So I think because we know that, the real reason that we don't really want to enter into it is because it's not the fact that we're afraid that Jesus will find out who we really are. I think we're afraid of ourselves finding out who we really are. Maybe I don't want to know what's really going on underneath there. Maybe I don't want to know who I really am. Maybe I don't believe who I'm going to see. Maybe God will show me uh, a person who is so loved and adored, and I just think, no, I don't really believe that. I don't want to see that. So we know Jesus already knows, and I'll come back to this later, but this is a really simple point. I just want you to know that Christ, he knows you. He still loves you. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5 The third point that might help you to uh, remember is a really simple one. We forget that God is God. We forget that God is God. There's this guy in the Bible, in the Old Testament, his name was Moses. Uh, He murdered a man, didn't know who his parents were, he was confused, he ran away from home, and he has this encounter with this burning bush, this spirit of God, and he starts speaking to him powerfully. And uh, he falls down, he takes off his shoes, because it's a holy place. 
And he's so vulnerable and he's so exposed and he, and he goes, God, tell me my mission. What do I do? I'm so ashamed of my past. Tell me what I'm supposed to do. And he says, go and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Moses says, all right, what do I tell them? God says, just tell them I'm God. He says, I am that I am. Or other translations say, I am who I am. And I'm sure they had maybe a bit of to and fro. Moses is like, okay, just getting this straight. When I go up to Pharaoh and say, let God's people go, and he goes, why? You want me to say, because God is God. And God's like, yep, I am who I am. And Moses says, hang on, you want me to go up to Pharaoh, say, let my people go, and the reason is because you are God. I think Pharaoh already knows that, or he doesn't believe that. Can you give me something more here, God? Come on, mate. And God just proclaims again, I am who I am. And I think there's a bit of a clue here. Um, When we look at human history with God, we look at the Old Testament, when we see uh, the people of Israel and their relationship with God, really, it's all about them forgetting time and time and again that they are God's people. They're forgetting time and time again that God is God. They get depressed, they get downtrodden, they get uh, smited by other nations. And they go, God isn't God, he can't save us, we're going to lament and do all these bad things. And God comes and reminds them, he sends a prophet, I am God, I am the Lord your God. And then other times they get proud and they get rich and wealthy, they start worshipping mammon. He's like, I think I said that right, Someone can, a theologian can correct me. He's like the God of money and they get pride, pride and all that kind of stuff and they're really kind of top stuff. And God sends a prophet and he says, just remember, I'm God. God is God. Just remember. And if we remember that simple fact, I think it'll help us understand who we are in the eyes of God. When we say to God, who am I? He responds, I am who I am. We go, no, God, I know you're God. Who am I? God says, I am who I am. He's trying to remind us that who we are isn't just in some weird relation to God, but who we are is found in God, that our life is hidden in Christ. Who we are is grounded and founded in Jesus. That's why he responds with, I am God, I am Christ, I am your saviour. Hidden in Christ, as the scriptures say. I want to give you some practicals as you're going away from today. You're thinking, how can I get real in my life? How can I practice being vulnerable and open and being a a real person who has real relationships and isn't afraid to be open and all this good stuff, all the good stuff of life that we remember, even the bad, but the real things of life that we remember. I want to give you six quick points how to get real. Mm. God is God. Remember that. Okay, God is God. That's a really simple one. And I won't actually say much about that, but if you can reflect on that, in the next week in your daily prayer, as I'm sure you will all commit to. Um, If you can just reflect on this idea that God is God and I am not, that's going to take you places, hey? That's going to take you places. The second one, see yourself how God sees you. Um, Caitlin uh, was sharing with with me the other day that she was feeding Sam. It was late at night and he was crying and he was being really stroppy. And the thing with babies is that when they're tired, they get really frustrated like we do. And they cry. And you know that to make them feel better, they have to go to sleep. But they won't because they're crying, because they're tired, because they have to go to sleep. But you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's so frustrating. Anyway, she's sitting there trying to like, uh, you know, pat him and do all these things and like say spells over him and all that kind of stuff. We don't do that. Uh, Prayers, prayers over him and stuff like that. You know, like go to sleep. And she just goes, Matt, last night I was just in that moment and I thought, this must be how God feels with us, right? Like, we're just, like, crying and waving and yelling and, I don't want to do this, I don't want to do that. And God's like, it'll be so good for you if you just do what I sell, do what I tell you, do what I say. If you see yourself how I see you and follow my will for you, man, it's going to be so good. Just stop crying, please, okay? Now, I don't say stop mourning and going through life as we have to. But what I'm saying is that start to try and see yourself as God might see you. And that's going to rock your world as well. Um, if we actually did see ourselves as God sees us as well, that's actually pretty radical because then we would start asking questions like, God, okay, what do you want me to do today? Okay, God, I've got this thought about myself right now and I want to do this thing that I'm being pressured to do or I think this is the right way to go, but I'm not sure. God, you see me. You know who I am. I want to look at myself the way you see me. What do you think, God? It'll change the whole dynamic of our day when we go to God first and go, 
How do you see me? How do you see us? The second, third, third point, remove shame. We remove shame by not doing shameful things and by seeking forgiveness if we do. Okay? Jesus doesn't enjoy seeing us ashamed. He doesn't enjoy seeing us. He doesn't want us to feel ashamed, like we can't do anything. He wants to remove that shame, not by being okay with our sin, but by redeeming it, by saving us from it, by plucking us out of it and going, you don't have to do that again. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to do that. Remove shame. Fourth one is have human relationships. Yes, I said have human relationships. There was this big study in the USA called the Grant Study, and it was done over 75 years, and over $20 million were pump, pumped into it. And all that money and time was wasted, because I bet you everyone in this room could have told me the finding that they discovered at the end of this study. And that was that people's happiness is based in people and relationships. That's what they found out. Okay, and if you're looking for evidence and data about this, look at the Grant Study in the USA from Harvard. Look into all the details on how they did it. They followed people their whole lives. And they found out something that I'm pretty sure we could all say at the tip of our tongue. True happiness for these people was found in people and relationships. Have human relationships, guys. And um, Facebook Messenger and Snapchat streaks, they don't count, I'm sorry. They do not count. Um, I would argue that having a relationship through a device is just that, having a relationship through a device. Can I simply challenge you to use those devices to organise times to meet up in real life. That's all I ask. Okay, you still have those streaks, but maybe every uh, 20th streak you get to, go, hey, when's our next coffee catch-up? Hey, I haven't chatted to you in person yet. Okay, can I challenge you to have human relationships? There was another study I was listening to a speaker recently. She made a really interesting point on something she called the touch-hungry generation. She said that uh, experimental studies at Oxford that they're doing nowadays uh, are showing that smell and touch are more strongly linked to mental health than even sight and sound. Get out there and hang out with real people. Have a hug, have a sniff. Get to know how people smell. Okay? Seriously. It's awesome. Have human relationships. Have human relationships. Because those are the people that are going to walk by you when you're trying to be vulnerable, when you're trying to live life the way you know it should be lived and you're trying to do the right thing and, and you need help and you need support and you need laughter and joy. Man, it's those humans that are around you that are going to help you, okay? Next one is suffer. That's a tough one. Suffer. Um, I actually won't really go too much into this one. I want to challenge you as well this week as you remember these things and when you think of this suffer point, just think of the letter S for suffer and think saint. I want you to start looking at the lives of the saints. Put your hand up if you know one particular saint really well. You've read books on them. You know this one saint kind of thing. That's awesome. Next month, I would love way more hands to be, to be held up in the air, okay? If you dig into the lives of the saints, find someone that you really connect with, like, oh my gosh, they just totally get me, okay? If you just dig into their life, you will find there's so much fruit and goodness about this really difficult topic about suffering. And I'm not going to talk much on it, because I wouldn't do it justice. But just trust me when I say, find a saint that you connect with and see how they dealt with suffering. See how they turned it into a fruit, a goodness, something that was glorifying God. It's pretty amazing. And the last point, actually, before I do that, I want to say this. If we want to truly get real, sometimes that will mean getting real with suffering and sadness and working through it, facing up, to truths and realities that hurt us, that offend us. But I know that you and I would much rather a sad truth and a happy life. We'd much rather that. The last one is be honest. Be honest. Oh, My man, awesome, great. Be honest by your actions matching your words honest by being the same person all the time, no matter who you're with. Authenticity. Be honest by not lying to yourself, by admitting when we might be wrong, 
where maybe we don't know the best for us. Maybe forgetting that God is God and we're his creation, but that we are so loved and that he has a plan for us. Be honest in that. It's kind of like we're walking on this tightrope, right? We're like a circus performer. Life can be a circus sometimes. And we've got these balancing poles. And on one side is the truth of our identity, that we're human. And that we suffer and we go through pain and we sin and we fail. And the other side of this balancing pole is that we are loved. We are created and adored. That Christ died for us. And if we fall to down this way, we think a lie that is we are nothing but sinners. And that's not true. And if we go too far this way, we fall into another lie that is we can do no wrong. We fall into pridefulness. And we think no one can tell me what to do with my life. No one can suggest that I might be doing things a bit differently or maybe this would be a good suggestion for me. God, I'm going to pick and choose these bits, but maybe not that because that makes me uncomfortable. I want to encourage you to find that balance. Find that balance because that's real. That's the reality and that's the truth. Is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us and we are so loved. Um, I want to encourage you tonight to be real with God to be real with Jesus. I want to encourage you tonight in your prayer to remember that story of that embarrassing moment that you shared with your friend, get that emotion up and go, Jesus, you're not ashamed of me. I don't have to feel that emotion when I'm praying to you or dialoguing with you. You love me. You want to help me. You have a great plan for my life. 